This episode of The Startup Life is sponsored by SaveTheChildren.org. Startup Nation, Save the Children believes every child deserves a future. In the United States and around the world, they work every day to give children a healthy start in life, the opportunity to learn, and protection from harm. They deliver lasting results for millions of children, including those hardest to reach. They do whatever it takes for children every day and in times of crisis transforming their lives and the future we share. Startup Nation, right now, the coronavirus is the biggest global health crisis in our lifetime. It threatens children in every way. COVID-19 has already left many children without caregivers, out of school, and exposed to violence and exploitation. Child poverty is rising. With your support, we can help children in unsafe households and help support distance learning in the face of school closures. Here are some ways your support can make a difference. For just $5, you can buy a baby's first book, providing comfort and inspiring lifelong learning. And for $25, you can serve a nutritious breakfast and lunch to five out-of-school children in need. And there's many other ways you can help support Startup Nation. So go to savethechildren.org slash savekids or www.savethechildren.org forward slash savekids. So if you're ready to make a difference, Startup Nation, remember, savethechildren.org. Make the change for children. This episode of The Startup Life is brought to you by People Ready. Startup Nation, you have a lot on your plate. The last thing you need to stress about is finding quality staff or the available work you need to be successful. Save time and headache by working with a trusted staffing partner that meets your everyday needs. People Ready is a national staffing provider with over 600 locations across the country and 30 plus years of experience serving people just like you. They specialize in a variety of industries including retail, manufacturing, logistics, general cleaning, hospitality, construction, and more. People Ready understands that you're busy and on the go. That's where their mobile app, JobStack, comes in. Use the app to place orders or find work 24-7 or wherever you are. And as social distancing continues to change the way we interact with customers, colleagues, and our everyday lives, JobStack provides the ability to find the right temporary workers or work you need while eliminating the amount of physical touch points needed in the staffing process. Visit PeopleReady.com forward slash Startup Life to learn more about how you can partner with People Ready. Payoff.com sponsors this episode of The Startup Life. Startup Nation, you've tried balance transfers and budgeting, but high interest rates and unrelenting bill cycles make it almost impossible to get out of credit card debt on your own. Instead of another new savings technique, you need a clear path out of debt. And that's what a payoff loan can do. A payoff loan is a personal loan backed by member-centric credit unions designed to help you pay off your credit cards. With rates as low as 5.99% APR and loan amounts up to $35,000 with no hidden fees and personal customer service support from payoff to help you reach your financial goals. Some of the benefits of a payoff loan may also include a personal credit score boost, one monthly payment, and savings from lower interest rates. Go to payoff.com forward slash the startup life to learn more. Checking loan rates won't affect your credit score. And if you listen to the replay on the podcast, the link is there in the show notes. Try something new. Pay off your credit card debt with payoff. NMLS ID number 1396805. Now all applicants may qualify. Loans only available within the United States. Loan is not available in all states. Payoff works with lending partners who originate the loans. Additional terms, conditions, and eligibility requirements may apply. More information is available at payoff.com forward slash the startup life. It's time to be about that life. The startup life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation, so I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is The Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career-minded professionals. Startup Nation, look, I just hope you're not only ready to take some notes, but I hope you're ready to laugh a little bit because, look, we have a fantastic guest on the show. If you remember a few weeks back, I did a book review for an amazing book, Call Flip Flops and Microwave Fish. Clearly, there's a story behind the title of the book, and we're going to get into that a little bit. But we have the author of that book here on the show. He is the president of Clear Communication and founder, host, author, and advice columnist 
of advice from someone else's dad. He was born and raised in Manhattan and he still lives there. He has an undergraduate degree from Princeton and an MBA from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. He's an amazing author. He's an amazing uh, mentor. And I want you to welcome Peter Yawich. Uncle Pete, how's it going, man? <laughs> <laughs> it's, going, it's going great. It's great to be here in Startup Nation, and I love your energy. And uh, boy, you made me sound more impressive than I really am. Oh, uh, you know you're you, you know you are pretty <laughs> awesome, Peter. You know you're pretty awesome. Are you ready to pour some knowledge into Startup Nation today? I am ready to go. All righty. So first things first, Peter, if you would, just kind of share with us your origin story and your background a little bit more, if you would. Yeah. You know, you said I, I grew up in Manhattan and I still live there. I think, you know, you, you try to, to understand what defines you. And mm -hmm. part of me is, you know, if I had to say, like, what are the things that define me? And I think that uh, growing up in Manhattan, in New York City, really is a major part of that. And I think it's because you, see, you know, you cannot help associating with and dealing with every type of person in the world. I mean, it's a melting pot. So you have people from different cultures. You have people who are visitors. You have tourists. You have people who are rushing to, to compete with you. And I think to succeed, it really makes you understand the motivations of people and to help you understand how to get along. So, you know, it's interesting when I, when I hear, heard you say that, I think, well, does that mean anything to people? Some people have a vision of like, oh, he's up in Manhattan. He must be but fill in the blank. I don't even know what that is. Gotcha. But from my perspective, I think that's what it's really defined who I am just because of the, the number of different types of people you encounter all the time. So, you know, uh, that was the, that's the first thing that I want to say. Another thing that I, that I do bring up, and I, I started bringing up this recently as also part of who I am and what makes me who I am. Um, I, I grew up with a chronic illness, so okay. I missed a lot of school, and it, it, it affected how people perceive me through, mostly through adolescence. And I think, again, that has made me put a little hard outer shell to be able to be prepared what people might think, to think in advance about, all right, what someone might be thinking of me, how do I have to diffuse anything before I open my mouth, and it's taken me years to realize that, but I think that informed a lot of why I do what I do, which is to help people in organizations figure out how to get their points across to different audiences. And and when people say, well, what gives you, no one really says this to me, but if, if I just say, what gives me the right to say I can give advice, right. I think a lot of it is, you know, what I bring to to my work, what I, what my life experiences have been and how I've had to learn it on my own. And I think that just it adds a little credibility in a, in a different way, a different flavor to the way I approach problems. I hear that. I hear that. Thank you so much for sharing that for sure. You know, Peter, you know, unless you're living under a rock and even if you are, you're, you're still know about the coronavirus and COVID-19. And so it's kind of forced us to kind of, you know, engage in a new normal out there, if you will, just so if you would just kind of share with us kind of what's your new normal, you know, going on these days as you not only work in your business, but also in your personal life as well. What is your new normal looking like right now, Peter? Well, I think that, you know, you learn after you've been you've been through difficult times, you have to realize that there are things that you can't change. Right. right. So you can't wait. No one can really change this. I am, as I said, I'm in Manhattan and there's a lot of virus around us. Right. But so you say, all right, how can I live my life given the fact that there are certain limitations? I'm not going to let it prevent me from doing at least some normal things. But of course, there are some, you know, I, I, I don't go beyond a certain num a certain radius around my apartment. Uh, and I have spent a lot of time at home. My wife is now working from home. We have an adult daughter who is living at home. Gotcha. So, you know, every, everybody has their stories that way. And I think people have accepted that in Zoom meetings. People are not going to say, can you shut your kid up? Because, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm trying the best I can. Right. So I think we, you know, or in the previous, you know, the old normal, we would say, OK, let's be fair. Please lock your kid up and, you know, put duct tape over their mouth for at least 20 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you deal with the consequences later, but not right. for me, because I really have to get a conversation done with you. But mm -hmm. so we're, we're accepting of those things a little bit more. Absolutely. But also um, another thing that, that I've noticed and I've written about this recently is that – and I just had a conversation right before this about sure. what is community now in business? I hear that. It, you know, it's like when, when you're live and working in an office, okay, you are all, all there for a shared goal. But now – 
you know, the community is separate. We all have different lives. You know, you and I live in different cities, but we might be working on the same team. You know, we have different, we're different stages of our lives. We have different demographics. Okay. So what does that, what does that mean is that there's an emotional side that has to be a part of how we communicate with one another and not be ashamed of that. Absolutely. And I think that for leaders, especially they, and this is whatever the new normal is going to be. And the new normal is not going to be the old normal. The new normal is going to have to be that leaders are going to have to open themselves up more to be able to show that they are one of us. And even when you just asked me that question, how am I dealing with things? I think it's important for everyone to know what your life is. Before we started, you said you, you are working from home, uh, in, in your home, which is right by an airport and right. the Memphis airport where the FedEx planes like I now, okay. Now it gives me a window into understanding you a little bit better. Right. Uh, okay. If there's a plane going by, I would say, my God, how unprofessional is he doesn't <laughs> soundproof his room. It's like, we're all just trying to be the best that we can be. And I hope that just opens us up to not being as rigid as we were before to mm. recognize that life is not, black and white there are tons of gray areas and we have to be able to find out what how we can work together as effectively as possible absolutely you know when when you talk about you know zoom meetings and stuff like that i think the classic video of the little girl walking in on her uh dad yeah uh, (laughs) yeah yeah. you know i think that definitely kind of rings a bell for sure so startup nation once again we're talking to peter yawitz the author of Flip flops and microwave fish navigating the do's and don'ts of workplace culture. And, you know, Peter, when I first saw the title of this book, I was like, okay, this is, this is different. This is unique. (laughs) Right. And so kind of walk me through the title uh, of the book, because I'm not going to lie. That's what drew me in first. Well, I'm glad. And I can't take full credit for the title because okay. my publisher has a titling committee. Ah. I, I was thinking, it, you know, for the longest time, just as the advice from someone else's dad project, I wasn't sure what the title was going to be, right. uh, you know, communicating in the new new normal, communicate. You know, I do lectures that are called how to communicate in a multicultural, multinational and uh, workplace. And it was going to be something like that. But I knew there had to be some catch. And my my publisher came up with a bunch of ideas and they just took things that were in my book now flip-flops i mentioned maybe once like can i wear flip-flops to work you know right. something like that right. and, I, and my and my answer is hey if you work as a lifeguard go be my guest <laughs> right <laughs> and, and also but also you know what the norms are if you're working in silicon valley or you're working for a startup and people are barefoot who am i to say no you have to wear wingtips right i'm not one to or pumps i'm not one to say that the point is you just have to know what is accepted at your place of work so that was just one thing and because but but the point is that question does come up a lot you know is it okay to to wear flip flops and for people from my older generation we'll, we'll say things like can you believe that woman wore flip flops to the office and all right if it's going to bother somebody and affect how people perceive you it's a thing right and the other thing the, the microwave fish i mentioned that really as a as a cross-cultural uh, example right. Right. where people might be offended and i've i've been in area in offices where there might be a new, uh, in fact, I, I'll be very specific about it. Please. I was in a, an office in Salt Lake city and which, before, you know, I've been there going there for years. It was very much a you know, all white type of office. Right. And then, then they started to hire more engineers and the university of Utah uh, has a very large Indian population. Mm-hmm. And I, I noticed that and they started to hire in some of these companies that were Previously, maybe in all, you know, very homogeneous type of people. Right. So I think that's great. We need some diversity in this company. But one thing that's diversity, you notice, is like when you go into the office kitchen, you start smelling curry and all sorts of other things that you wouldn't smell right. eating up in a microwave. And I just mentioned it as something like, if you don't like it, then go to your own office. It, and Because this is what you've got to deal with. Right. We're all human. We all have a new visit eating. And this is something you could learn. Look at it as an opportunity. So my, my publisher said, well, we should do something called microwave fish. And I said, oh. Oh, really? So then I asked my uh, my son, who is 30, and I said, what do you think of the title Microwave Fish? And he said, I'm so sick of the, this whole thing about microwave fish. <laughs> and I said, you mean it's a thing that people talk about all the time? He's like, oh, my God, people talk about it all the time. And I said, well, then it's going to be in the title if it's a thing. <laughs> so that's uh, that's how. And, and I tell you, I get emails all the time from people saying, like, you never believe someone microwave fish the other day. Someone microwave fish about the, right. the other day. So it clearly is a thing. 
clearly. it can't it can stink up that microwave. So my advice is if you're going to microwave whatever that has any either is curry powder or fish, make sure you have some Lysol wipes when we get back to right. the new normal of sharing a sharing a microwave. Absolutely. And also when we get back to the new normal, you can find Lysol wipes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> well, you have to make do these days, a little rag and some yeah. spray, just spray, whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I'm glad you talked about that, that story. Thank you for sharing that story because you talk about, you know, that in your book, as far as like, you know, that cross cultural, that diversity mm-hmm. piece mm-hmm. in the well, you know, kind of, you know, dive into that a little bit because it's not just diversity of about how people look, but it's also, you know, th- that those different backgrounds bring diversity of thought as well, bring different yeah. angles into the workplace. Kind of share with us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I'll bring a couple of things. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that last thing about diversity of thought because mm-hmm. uh, I've gotten questions about how do I put, you know, my boss said, put together a good team. Mm-hmm. And the easiest thing for someone to do is like, oh, good, let's, I can, I can bring Timmy and Johnny and you know, Benny and all my best buds who are just like me right. into this because I, I like working with them. And then you get a bunch of people sitting around just liking each other and having a great time. I'm not sure anything is going to get done. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in even getting, you know, thinking about product people. It's like, you know what? We don't have someone who really knows the HR function well enough. This person has her ear to what's going on in HR. This person has a great ear to someone in the supply chain office. This person does this. And, but it's not only just trying to find the, the people that can help you be linked to other people. It's think about the way people think. Think about how somebody, someone's background might allow us to understand this type of culture or this type of customer a little bit better because I don't know offhand and I want to be able to, to tap into that better. Right. So, so for so much for me, it's, it's, and then the other side of it is first impressions that people make. And it's not, I say it's really not, I think we're beyond, I hope we're beyond to some point how we look, but it's really, right. you should care more about how you behave than how you look. I hear that. So, you know, if you're, if you walk in and you're wearing like, and I've had questions about this too, you know, I wear ethnic uh, garb right? and I wonder what people think about me in that. And my feeling is you shouldn't worry about that. And if somebody questions you, you can just explain it or just say, Oh, I felt like wearing this today because uh, it's so colorful. And you don't have to explain beyond that because right. you're, you know, as long as you're not, you know, wearing, kill the world t-shirt and you know or something that's that's inappropriate like the you know a leather something that's right i mean not a leather you know what i mean uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna go there Fair enough. something that let's just say inappropriate for for a ch- child walking into the office uh, absolutely um, you know there's no one you don't have to explain something as long as you're dressed and someone's a view of what's appropriate. Right. For sure. Thank you for sharing that, Peter. I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, if I can ask a quick follow up, because you talked about, yeah. you know, you know what people wear and, and stuff like that. And that brings me to chapter two, startup nation, you know, everything uh-huh. communicates and you talk about what to wear and things yeah. of that nature, what that says about you and stuff like that. I was curious. Cause you know, you, you grew up in Manhattan, New York uh, area and stuff like that. And so if I'm reading this book and I live in, I don't know, Omaha, Nebraska, yeah. Right. You know, you know, what are some of those steps I should take, you know, to kind of start being open minded about, you know, what people wear or uh, certain hand gestures like, you know, the the OK <laughs> symbol for <laughs> us may be something totally different yeah. in, in a different culture. So kind of walk us through that a little bit, because I thought chapter two was really good about that. That is a really the thing about the OK system is, is really interesting. And the only way you're going to be able to know that in advance is maybe look you know, I, you know, look at something in Google and say, what do hands gestures mean? But, right. but never assume, uh, never. So I've, I've worked a lot in Brazil where people do the thumbs up all the time, which mm. is great because my Portuguese knowledge is really not very good. So if someone you know, says something to me and I think I know it, I'll just do thumbs up and, right. uh, and hope they're not saying, you know, something that, right. you know, will you give me a million dollars? Oh, thumbs up. You bet I will. So, uh, but the first part of your question was someone from from Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm, you're just picking that completely at random. Right. I um, I, you know, as I said before, I hope that people are a little bit more open minded than they they used to be about how people look, and and you have to get beyond whatever whatever prejudices or biases you have, because that can only interfere with what's the most important communication school uh, skill, and that is listening. Right. Because what gets in our way of good listening is any kind of distraction. And 
the first skill I encourage people, young people to master when they start a new job is really up your listening skills mm. because we have we, we are all distracted by so many things now, especially electronic communication. I, I could be sitting there. You could be we're, we're on the phone right now. We don't see each other, but you have no idea what I'm looking at on my screen. Right. By the way, my screen is totally blank about looking at anything. <laughs> but 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 in business, you, people are always multitasking. Right. So people are distracted by lots, lots of things. And it could be the environment. It could be hot in here. It could smell of microwave fish. It could be that I was really tired or I drank too much last night or the person I'm talking to reminds me of someone that I went to school with. We are distracted by all sorts of things. Or I see something on my desk. Oh, shoot, I should have followed up on that. So it gives us reasons not to listen. Right. And I, I encourage young people to think about the first thing is do almost like a, a distraction audit. What makes you distracted? And you have to be able to find ways to say, okay, I, I have to move that out of my mind be able and be able to focus on what somebody is saying. And so then the first thing is really to think about what does distract you and know how to combat that. And the next thing is to start listening, effectively listen to not only the words that people are saying, but try to understand the emotion and the rationale behind what someone is saying. And then just to make sure you get it right, there's nothing wrong for you to say, to, as Dominic, as you do now sometimes, you say, so Peter, in other words, what I hear you saying is this. Mm -hmm. And I love it when somebody says that back to me because they're not faking it. Right. How right. do you fake it when you're listening? It's what we all do. You know, you look someone in the eye and go, uh-huh. Gotcha. Oh my God. Right. I mean, we, we all know how to do that. Right. Oh no. Oh really? Oh, you know, we all know how to do that. But when you say back to me, so Peter, in other words, what you said was, I think, wow, he really was listening. And I, I don't care if you're taking notes. It doesn't matter. I just want to know that I, that my messages have gotten across. So if it means that in a, in a first meeting that you have that you take notes and, or you can do it in your mind to, to paraphrase some information someone has said, more power to you. It's a hard skill to master and one of the most important. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure, Peter. You know, Startup Nation, when you read Flip Flops and Microwave Fish, there's a lot of things that many of us are kind of accustomed to as far as like workplace culture, how to you know, you know uh, write emails and things of that nature. But I think Peter does a really good job of providing a different spin on it uh, and stuff like that. You know, and I really appreciated a lot of the humor. I really did you know so, oh thanks yeah for sure so kind of tell me did you feel like there was a void in the marketplace when it comes to books like this to where they're kind of like they're kind of uptight and you know have to be all stoic and stuff like that and he's like nah forget all that you know, let's have a little fun with it right you no know, is that just by nature is that something you just kind of want to do kind of share with me a little bit about well that. i think i think it's my nature and i also think that i you have to distinguish yourself somehow and that right. was an easy thing for me to do yeah. uh the other thing that i like to to think about is that i don't like books that, uh, that, that, as I said before about the black or white, you have to do it this way, right. you know, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way, because there are so many gray areas in life. I like to think, okay, I'm giving you guidelines. So if, if I think about here's a, right, a way to write an email, it doesn't mean every email has to be like that, but think about what the process was as I put it together. You don't want to do this, obviously, because then I show a bad example, and you don't want to do this, and then I show another bad example on the other side. Right. So I'm, I am always give practical advice, but always think about them not as rules, but as guidelines instead. And one of the things about emails that, that I use all the time, and it's really it's not just for emails, but it's for any time that you're thinking about an audience, it, completely unscientifically, I say, let's divide audiences up into what I call tier one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. you know, th again, guidelines. Right. And I just think of it in terms of tier one people are the people with the shortest attention span. You know, so if I said, hey, Dominic, and I'm trying to catch your attention as you run out of the room, right. that's a tier one person. Tier four person is somebody who's going to say, oh, what do you have to say, Peter? Let me pull up a chair and listen to you and it might give you 20 minutes. Gotcha. So let's say you're writing to multiple audiences. You've got the tier one people who are speaking to the tier one people and tier two and tier three and tier four. You have to make sure that you get your points out pretty fast for the tier one people to poke their head in the door, say, oh, good point, and then walk out and feel all right. For that person, I'm pretty. I, I think I got my point away a good uh, uh, across for that person. Gotcha. So for let's think about emails for example. Emails are designed or can be designed to help you with those different tiers. So tier one people, the first thing they're going to look at is a subject line. 
So you better have a good subject line rather than just update. Right. Because tier one people is like, eh, when you find me, you'll tell me the update. I'm not reading it now. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, update for that for a tier one person, but we signed the deal, we go live March 3rd. All right. Mm. Oh, tier one person, like, great. That's all I need to know. Tier two would be the first couple of sentences you write in, a, in an email, which is a little bit more detailed. Tier three are the people who will actually scroll down in an email and read more. And tier four, as I say, uh, God invented attachments for tier four people. That's why God invented <laughs> attachments. So the worst thing you can do for someone is to say, you know, to Dominic, FYI, and then attach a PDF. If you're a tier two person, you want to say, thanks a lot, Peter, for making me click on this attachment without giving me anything. <laughs> Just tell me, no, let me know what it's about. Thank you for sharing all of that. You know, and speaking of emails, right, a, a lot of times that, you know, people get in trouble because like it's kind of hard to read tone in emails right yeah kind of kind of share with us a little bit about that if you would peter because there's a lot of people you know graduating college right now getting ready to enter corporate america and that email uh chapter five uh as it is chapter five you really kind of dive into that so just kind of talk about that tone in emails and how to approach that dominic i'm so flattered that you know my chapters better than i do if you said <laughs> what chapters on email i'm like i don't know i have to check the book <laughs> so chapter five is email. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Email tone is really important right? because when I'm talking, you know, when we, when you used to have the real world, I'd stand in front of you, we talk, we see each other's eye contact, we get to know one another. Uh, and the tone, even if I said something that's somewhat cynical, you could see the smile in my face right? and you could say, oh, okay, I get Peter. That's fine. But then again, if I didn't think someone had a good sense of humor, I wouldn't do that. So the, the last thing you want to do is have cynicism or a little snarkiness in email because right. you have no idea whether the other person has a sense of humor or maybe I do have a sense of humor, but right now I'm in a lousy mood. Right. So if you said this looks real exciting, I don't get that sarcasm. Uh, I can think, oh, he thinks it's really exciting when the person was like putting a smirk in there. And don't try to hide it with a you know emoji smirk face today. It's like you, there are other ways you can do it. Like just be honest about what you what you have to say. Mm -hmm. So tone can be misconstrued because I when I'm talking on the phone, you could hear the tone of my voice. Right. When I'm when you have an email, all you have is the words, and things can come out not only on a, an aggressive perspective or a passive aggressive, but right. also on a passive one. Mm -hmm. I mean, an example would be. Um, I know this is a really hard time for you, Dominic, but if you have a time, could you possibly, if it's not, if it's okay, maybe for you to kind of get this information to me on Wednesday, if you possibly can, but if you can't, just let me know. And you just want to say, hey, do you have a spine in your body? Right. You know, it's this person is just like shrinking entirely, like with no backbone. So for, for, for those kind of emails, it's just on the other end of being a, a complete personal, you know, person doormat. Whereas if you said someone, I need this, this information by five, can you imagine walking into somebody's office and saying, I need this information by five first thing in the morning without saying good morning. Right. So add those pleasantries. So um, the moral of the story for me, really for a lot of communication, it's not just emails, always be direct about what you want, but have this overlay of being polite. Absolutely. So be, be direct, be, be uh, assertive. So you take away this spectrum of aggressive and passive always be assertive but make sure you're polite put the extra please and thank you in there make sure you say you know hope you're well and uh, i hope you're staying safe in these emails today because they really do mean a lot gotcha you know and peter i appreciate you sharing that because a lot of times we have this misconception about you know whether uh we're entrepreneurs or in, in the business world that you know we have to be assertive we have to be strong all good business yeah. people are you know are this way pounding the fist mm -hmm. on the table and mm -hmm. stuff like mm -hmm. that but you know you, you really do express this in the book that you know a little bit of compassion can go a long way yeah yeah, yeah. well i think you know what you're saying is pounding the table i look at that as aggressive but i can mm -hmm. i can be direct and say what i want right uh i don't want to be around the bush i mean this is something that sure. is hard for people who are non-Americans, let's say an Asian culture, which is, I mean, they admit to me that they're coming from a, a culture where you don't say what you want. You're a little bit more oblique about what you want. Right. And so saying, uh, I'd like this information for our managers. 
I'd like you to prepare this information for our senior management by three o'clock so I'll have enough chance to read it by four. Even when I say that to you, that seems, oh, that sounds reasonable. You're giving me enough time so you can read it. But even for someone in a different culture, they, they might think, oh, my, that's too strong. But I have to train people who are working in an American culture that, no, that's absolutely appropriate as long as you give me a rationale for something right. and say, thanks so much. If they, please let me know if you have any questions. I'm, I'm here all afternoon if you need me to work on something else to show willingness to work together, but also be specific about what you want. Because if you're not specific, you leave anything out, then there's going to be another round of emails saying, well, what exactly did you mean? And no one really has time for that. Absolutely. I had, a quest- I had a question for somebody who's, uh, he came up to me after a seminar and he said, what would you have done in a situation like this? My okay. manager, he said, no, he said this to me. I mean, you can answer it too if you want to. But okay. he said, I, am I, I needed something for my manager for work. I needed some information. Okay. He didn't tell me what it was. And he said, so I texted my manager, you know, through the local, through the business tech system. And I said, uh, can I ask you a question? And the manager got back and said, sure, give me 10 minutes. And then this guy tells me, well, 10 minutes came and went and he never got back to me. And I wasn't sure what to do because I didn't want to bother him. So, you know, I just kind of let it go because he didn't get back to me. And part of me wants to say, what the hell's the matter with you? You know, if you need the information for work, Right. Don't let, you know, how many times have you said to someone, oh, I'll get back to you in five minutes. And then something else happens within those five minutes right. and you forget to get back. You might, oh, shoot, I forgot to let call back Peter and it's four o'clock. But it has nothing to do with I, I don't like you or I don't take you seriously. It's just things happen. Right. So. Absolutely. So I said to the guy, OK, you could have I mean, if you didn't do this originally, you could have gone to the person's office or you could have gone back in text and said oh i'm I'm free now anytime you're around uh please please get back to me or to be even more specific just to avoid this back and forth just ask me what the question is you know just just say i I, i'm meeting with the auditor at four o'clock and one i didn't have one value can you find this to me so i can get it to him by the end of the day before he leaves oh okay then i know what the task is and i'll get you that number so it would help rather than just say, got, got a minute, unless it's something I, I would say, if it's something very personal, I'm not sure I'd put anything personal in writing. Like, uh, I, you know, having some problem with someone, I would just say, can I, can I make an appointment to talk with you today? Right. What time works for you? And then set up a meeting invite. So it's on their calendars. Right. But, um, anyway, I don't want to fault that guy, but you can see why not being specific can mess everybody's day up. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I can definitely understand that. I, I, I think there was a, you know, I think sometimes people are trying to find that balance between, yeah, I, I, I need the answer, but I don't want to bother them. I want to be a, like a, you know, somebody who just gets on their nerves and stuff like All that. Right. Yeah. So right. I, I definitely get that. I actually, uh, there was a previous guest that I was trying to uh, have on the show and uh, I reached out to him. I was like, yeah, great. You know, we'll reach back out to the, the holidays and we'll set some up. And then like after the holidays, I was like, uh, yeah, I, I got to reach out to him because maybe, like you said, something may have come up. And so maybe right. just to send him a little reminder and stuff like that. So I definitely understand. And, and that's, yeah. you know, and that took me years to get to that point. Right, right. It took me years and, to know, get to that point. And also, you know, this is something, too. I mean, I know it's, it's cultural, but it's important for young people to remember that that what's the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing that can happen is the person doesn't get back to you. Right. right? But it doesn't, but the, the, someone is not going to say, leave me alone or don't ever bother me again, you piece of crap. You know, they're <laughs> right, not going to exactly. say that, right. but we're afraid of that. We're afraid of our reputation that that's what they might think, you right. know, let them think personally about that, but they're not going to say it. Right. Uh, the, and you know, it happens to me a lot even, uh, that I'll not a lot, but I mean, I'll email someone uh, as a follow up. We're going to talk about this, especially now. I mean, I, it might be frustrating for me that people are not responding to some of my emails emails that we mm-hmm. said we would follow up on. Right. But listen, people are, I like when people are honest with me and they'll say, Peter, right. And people have said that like Peter, right now, we just had to put everything on hold because right. all we're working on is making sure that our employees are safe of and course. that we're managing our business well. And I can't go back. Yeah. But you said you talked to me, you know, I can't do that. <laughs> right. right. That may have, what about me? Right. That may definitely have some effort, adverse effects there for yeah. you. In the exactly. Term. Yeah, for sure. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. All right, Startup Nation. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. We got to pay some bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson and you're listening to the startup life.
This episode of The Startup Life is tucked in nice and tight by Philip Stein and the Philip Stein Sleep Bracelet. Startup Nation, getting quality sleep is super important, especially for those of us as entrepreneurs. I know for me, if I don't get enough quality sleep, not only do I not perform well while working in my business or exercising, but also it really affects my mental health and that doubt starts to creep in. And that's the last thing we want as entrepreneurs. Also, with everything going on, good quality sleep is important to repair the body and support a good immune system. And that is why Startup Nation, I wear the Philip Stein Sleep Bracelet. The Philip Stein Sleep Bracelet uses natural frequency technology to reinforce our biomagnetic field to improve deep sleep, length of sleep, and overall sleep quality. This helps produce a healthier heart, regulate weight control, and helps strengthen the immune system, which helps destroy bacteria and viruses. Right now, when you go to philipstein.com, use code SLEEPEZ, and you will get 10% off the entire store. That's promo code SLEEP, capital E, capital Z. So if you are ready to be more productive in leading your business, go with the Philip Stein Sleep Bracelet, proven to be natural and safe to give you a better, deeper sleep. This episode of The Startup Life is brought to you by the Risk Management Society. Startup Nation, the Risk Management Society, or RIMS, is a global organization dedicated to the profession of risk management. For nearly 60 years, RIMS has delivered the latest strategies and resources that allow risk professionals to grow, innovate, and succeed in any business. RIMS works with industry leaders to produce content and online training that business professionals turn to. Topics include business continuity, cyber risk, risk management techniques, the fundamentals of insurance, and more. There is also a private members-only site where people can discuss sensitive issues and get honest answers. Members have been leaning on each other as we all navigate this global pandemic. If you're concerned about the safety of your employees and the sustainability of your organization, you need the resources and connections RIMS provides. Learn more at go.rims.org forward slash startup life. If you're listening to the replay on the podcast, we have a link there in the show notes. You can save 25% off a year long membership. So if you're ready to get the resources and strategies you need to manage risk, go with RIMS and join their global network of over 10,000 members across more than 60 countries. Support for The Startup Life is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Startup Nation, personal grooming is super important, not only from a hygiene standpoint, but also from a confidence one as well. And that is why you need to have a tight haircut and, well, a nice groomed undercarriage as well. And when doing that, you don't want to use the same razor, do you? That's just absurd. And this is why our friends at Manscaped have given you another option. Introducing the all new Lawnmower 3.0 by Manscaped. This lightweight and waterproof razor features precision engineered blades for safe trimming in sensitive areas and a 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology. Ladies, Father's Day is just around the corner and this will make a perfect gift for that guy on the go. Use code THESTARTUPLIFE in all caps for 20% off and free shipping on your brand new Lawnmower 3.0 at manscaped.com. We have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you're listening to the replay on the podcast. And while you're there, be sure to check out all the other products from manscaped.com as well. So for proper manscaping without the fear of hurting anything go with manscape trust me your family of jewels will thank you all right startup nation welcome back as we continue our conversation with today's guest here on the startup life once again we're talking to peter yawes the author of flip flops and microwave fish and you know uh, another thing i loved in the book uh startup nation is, is that you know not only does he have these chapters that, that highlight you know certain things like how to write an email to getting over you know nervousness in chapter six which if you remember our review is my chapter mvp meetings conference calls and presentations i thought that was pretty good especially given you know we were talking about earlier about zoom meetings and stuff like yeah, that stuff like yeah. that but you no know, I, I love how you have anecdotes you know you know i think and i think this comes from your someone else's dad blog if you will where yes, you kind of yes. reinforce those uh anecdote you know those uh points that you're trying to make a another one that i want to ask you about which i thought was interesting and put in uh chapter 10 have a nice trip and this is talking about yeah. when you go on business trips and and things of that nature and i think a lot of times especially i know when i was younger in corporate america you know i would you know probably not have certain etiquette uh you know uh play things in place you know when i go on business trips and stuff like that but kind of talk about the importance of maintaining a certain etiquette even though you're outside of the offices outside 
outside of the norm. And maybe there is a time for having a good time, but there's a certain level of, of etiquette and professionalism that you have to maintain. Yeah. And, you know, right now we're in a place that people are not doing business trips, for but sure. there is going to be some time when I think you'll, you know, people will have to do a business trip and mm -hmm. either travel by yourself or travel with the manager. Just keep in mind that when you're on a business trip, you are still representing the company no matter what you do. Right. And even right. when people are socializing outside of work, you are still at work. And people, you know, you become friends with people at work and sometimes your boss wants to make sure you're having a good time and maybe you'll go out for drinks. But I would just say, gosh, I, I hate to be an old fuddy-duddy about this, but I would just hope, because maybe I am after all, but I would just say just be on your best behavior because right. you don't want to embarrass yourself. And, and you certainly don't want somebody to post on anything like, look at us on our business trip. Woohoo! <laughs> and, you know, you are chugging something or right. in, a, in a compromising position. And I, I don't know, is, is that really worth it? Right. to to your reputation you know there are things that are different if it's a it's a corporate event and everybody's doing some activity okay well that's fair game i, I still think that that you're you're working you're having a social time but it's still these are not your best friends from college for or your these are different people right. they are work friends but you're still there has to be this little i'm not going to lose control of myself because it's still work now i know many people who who have said, oh, we got so wasted on this trip. My boss bought shots for everybody. Okay, I, I leave it up to you. I can't say no, don't get wasted because everybody uh, everybody else is doing you want to feel left out. But I just, if you can just maintain your sense of self and your dignity, uh, I would hate to have anything bite you in the butt come up at any point. Absolutely. So, you know, maybe that's, you know, that, that's, that's why I'm someone else's dad. I still have that dad persona of, right. I wouldn't want my kids to get in trouble. So I can't tell you not to do this, but really think hard about your reputation when you're with anybody from work. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. just, yeah, and, just be and, very careful. For sure. And, and especially in a day and age of video cameras and social media. Oh, and my like God. That. Yeah, you can find, you definitely find yourself in a very uncompromising situation. Yeah. And, sure. you know, so, and things can be misconstrued, too. I mean, that's true. Too. I remember my yeah. first my first business trip. I was flying with two managers and we, we were on a, like a three seated row on an airplane and our the most senior man. So I was. I might have been at the window and the other guy was on the aisle and the most senior manager got on the board plane late. We didn't have a sign seat. So he sat in the middle and he kind of looked at both of us and I didn't move, <laughs> mm, right. you know, but I thought even I still to this day, it's like, should I have said, oh, sir, you and he was a little guy, too. It wasn't right. as though he was a big, big guy. And it wasn't like super old or anything. Uh, and I just thought, did, should I have given him my seat? Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I mean, you look at both ways. Like, okay, he is the boss. He deserves a better seat. But then again, I got here early and right, I got the window exactly, seat. Right. You know, and I'm a human <laughs> being too. Why should I be uncomfortable? And we, I don't think we were going to – we might have been going to Washington. I mean, it wasn't as always a long flight from right. New York. Mm -hmm. But uh, I definitely thought about that. Another example I remember was I was a consultant uh, asked to go to a conference, and it was at a, a resort down in Florida. And a lot of the people, the non – I mean, people who worked there had golf carts to just cart clients around. Right. And it was a big place, and I didn't want to get a golf cart. So they had a bicycle, and the bicycle cost like 10 bucks uh, mm -hmm. to use because I thought if I'm going to get from place to place, I don't want to be late. I'll just rent this bicycle. And on my expense report, the HR person denied it. She said, we're not paying for extra you know, uh, exercise equipment, right. you know, and I didn't fight it. And like, it was only $10, but I thought, geez, you know, 10 bucks. And it's, right. you know, it's for me, but right. you never know how people are going to perceive anything, including, are you taking something from the mini bar? Mm, uh, right. that's, that's, that's going to be on your charge. Yeah. Like, Oh really? You had, you were desperate to have those $12 M&Ms from the <laughs> mini bar, <Right. laughs> you know, where it's like, oh, you want me to pay for those $12 M&Ms from the mini bar? <laughs> I love how you keep emphasizing that. <laughs> $12 right, exactly. M&Ms when you can go to, across the street to CVS and get them for whatever. Right. Uh, 
we're not having them at all. Thank yeah. you for sharing that for sure. I mean, I've had, I've had a friend of mine who works for who has his own company, and he had a young person, and he said every time we travel together, she would order the most expensive thing on the menu. Mm. And I imagine that the, their client was paying for it, right. but even still, it's like it seems so deliberate to him that she was doing that. And uh, you know, just watch it. That's right. all. Like, I, it's not, it, this is where it's like it, it's not. This is not a rule. It just be smart about. It. Right. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Me and my wife were talking about that. You know, about I have a, a cousin of mine who who does that with us when we take him out to eat and stuff like that. And I, and I was telling him, I was telling her the story of that. You know, I did that with my uncle when I was a kid one time. And yeah. he sit me down. I was like, you know, uh, I think we went to a, a deli. We was in Chicago. Went to a deli, and my uncle got like this sandwich or whatever, and I got like a porterhouse steak. I'm like 12 years old. <laughs> and I get this porterhouse steak. He's like, Dominic, look, and somebody, you know, look, I'm fine. I can pay for it. It's not a problem. But when you go to business meetings and stuff like that, and somebody else is paying for it, never get the most expensive thing on the mm-hmm. menu. So I, I well, definitely understand that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I mean, part of it too is that if you're, if you're being taken out, you should say, what, what looks good to you? What do you think you're having? So then you can then say, you see that the person's having a sandwich, which costs four ninety five. Right. You know, it's like, okay, that's what I'm expected to order too. Right. So, sure. uh, yeah, I, I think I, I, I always just, I mean, what looks good to you? What do you, what do you think you're having? What, what, are, you, what are you thinking? Right. And if someone says, well, I'm going to get the porterhouse steak. Okay, I see what I see what game we're playing now. Right. Okay, that means that is normal for what we could be doing. Right. I still might not go above what that porterhouse steak is, but I know the range that would be reasonable. Exactly, and I imagine that also, like if you're being taken out by a potential client or something like that, that's that has a certain communication. Uh, you know, right. uh, implications as well. Like this type That's of person right. does this, this type of person is that. Cause I remember uh, in college that my professor was telling us about if you get some meat, uh, get food and all of a sudden you just start seasoning. That tells me you're impulsive. That tells me that you're too quick oh. on the gun. You know what I mean? So, you know, and so I, I've always kind of took that to heart. So I appreciate you talking about that a little bit. But another thing too, is that you know, when you get somebody who's a real health nut and, and mm. they'll say, you know, I'm ordering in today and you see, they're just getting like B pollen and kale as right, uh, right. a, a big and kale. You can have everything on me. I'm just getting this. And then you order that, you know, it's just like if I ordered a hamburger when this person is so deliberately health conscious, I mean, right. I'm not going to order a bee pollen and kale shake just because this guy did, but right. maybe I'll think more of the salad rather than, you know, a, a burger and fries. Absolutely. So, you, you know, you don't want people to, to think that about, but you know, this goes back to your, what you said about before, about everything communicates, mm-hmm. you know, how we come across it, what behavior we have when we eat, what we order. And I did a little, a fun video that I have on my YouTube channel about right. what your, what your YouTube, what your zoom background says about you. Oh, okay. So people, people are making judgments. I mean, most people have are setting up however they have in their in their home offices, and some people don't have home offices. So they're in their kitchen or they're in front of a bookcase or a window. But you can look at that and say, "Oh, look, okay, I can see that they have a river view there. Oh, that's kind of expensive property there they have." Mm-hmm. Or they can say, "Oh, I see those books. Oh, I see a lot of mass market. I bet they read a lot of crappy stuff." Okay, I see what's important. <laughs> you know, it's right. like, "Oh, I see on the counter there's a bunch of Fritos and uh, and laced potatoes. Oh, that's the kind of household." You know, right. so. So it's not that I'm, I'm not, as I say that stuff, I just said it as fact. Mm-hmm. And, but you can, you can sure. okay, what do you think if you see in the background of, you know, Slim Jims and Fritos on, and Hawaiian Punch on the, on the counter, <laughs> right. you know, that's just a fact. <laughs> and then you think, okay, all right, that's what you're showing yeah. and you think is normal. But at least, you know, at least if you're doing it in your bedroom, make your bed. And uh, right. I, I was doing, a, actually, I did a podcast interview with someone. He was interviewing me. Okay. And he was doing it from his house. It was a video one. And he said, I, you know, I'm up in our bedroom. And, and his bedroom, clearly his wife had picked out the sheets because it was all like frilly and ruffly and, you right. know, pink colored and all that right. kind of stuff. So and I just said, it's like, oh, your wife obviously picked out those ruffly things. And he just laughed because, of course, it was true. Right. Well, actually, who knows if it was true? Maybe it was him. But was I didn't. Well, I should have made an assumption, right? But I, I made the point is that we're all making judgments about everything, you know, wh- what your homeware is and what your, you know, what I'm wearing and what's behind me, and 
and all that stuff. For sure, for sure. I, I just Funny. did a, a panel discussion uh, for a podcast masterclass. I had like seventeen hundred participants, and I, wow. I, I, I made sure that I, I did the the live stream part, like my video part, was in front of some family pictures of us at yeah. Niagara Falls and stuff like that. <laughs> so yeah, I did, you know, and I probably wouldn't have thought about that you know until you know if i hadn't read flip flops and microwave fish uh, because, yeah yeah nice plug by the way uh if i hadn't read flip flops and microwave fish and you can purchase that uh start make we have a link there in the show notes for easy access thank you no worries thank no you no worries uh so i, I want to ask you this because you talked about your youtube channel uh someone mm-hmm. else's dad and i and i seen one of the videos where uh you're you're doing like some zoom stuff and like you know you get up and maybe you maybe not have any pants on or whatever the case <laughs> <laughs> but kind of, yeah. yeah, but kind of talk about, you know, the someone else's dad kind of, you know, a uh, thing you got going and, and the YouTube channel and what you kind of hope to accomplish there. Well, the YouTube channel started a couple of years ago. Okay. I was I, I was doing some work in Dallas and I hired a, a videographer and I hired some local actors and I wrote a bunch of scripts where the young people were kind of on their own, but messing up and dad comes in sort of like the Superman, uh, Mm -hmm. to fix things for them. And they were, uh, they were fun. Then I stopped doing work in Dallas. So I stopped doing it down there. And I was about to resume here in New York, uh, right before I I cast it, I had a studio and then the pandemic hit and all the actors went home to mommy and the, they closed the studio. So I hope to be able to do that again. But in the meantime, I'm just trying to keep the comedy stuff alive with giving giving ideas by doing some funny stuff. So the one that you're referring to, which is on my YouTube channel, was me actually in that one. I was just saying how great my book was. And <laughs> and, uh, and I said, are we done now? And I stood up and I was wearing right. a suit. I was wearing a suit, but nothing. But I was wearing something. But I just wasn't wearing suit pants. Right. I was wearing uh, uh, what looks like underwear. Just under right. that. So the, the whole point of the, the someone else's dad is persona is i'm always going to and then we had this in, in the ones in dallas too is mm-hmm. that there's a little self-deprecation about dad of i mean course. as much as i give good advice i'm, I'm definitely in, in it for the self-promotion right so uh, there's another one where i say hey you can make a smoothie and you know the smoothie tastes terrible and anyway so i, I try to have fun and try to keep them short for my audience because uh people like them as short as possible on instagram that, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I, I love the YouTube channel, by the way. There was Thank one you. Where you, you was, uh, you know, at the end, you was like, hey, we need some more milk as well. So uh, it's just, it's just <laughs> oh, that yeah, that one was awesome. I, I love that, <laughs> that was great. That was that was a video we did in Dallas about um, uh, problems from working from home. I mean, like, who knew that right. was going to be a big thing? Right. And this woman who was working from home was totally disorganized. And mm-hmm. uh, and the videographer that I had was this big guy. And I said, God, it would be so funny. Let's get you in there looking in the refrigerator in the right. middle of like having to do with nothing. <laughs> right. And, you know, and he just said, oh, I, I got it. And he just puts his big ass out there looking in the refrigerator <laughs> and saying, hey, you're out of milk in the middle of it. And I just thought this is brilliant to have right. him do it. Absolutely. Uh, so funny. Absolutely. No, I, I loved all of them. They very much enjoyed uh, all of them for sure. And, and Startup Nation, you know, not only is, you know, he's the author of Flip Flops and Microwave Fish, not only is he uh, someone else's dad, but he's also the president and founder of Clear Communication. And he's had clients from uh, AIG, MetLife, Morgan Stanley, the list goes on and on, Oppenheimer Funds, on and on, Philip Morris. And, and so let me ask you this, you know, when people, you know, probably not doing as much now, but when people mm-hmm. bring you in to, you know, kind of help in the organization, what's what, what are some of those main things they're they're saying that they need help with well it could be a lot of things but usually mm-hmm. because i'm a communication consultant it usually has right. something to do with uh with communicating right, right. and i i would say for you you mentioned you mentioned a whole uh, wide swath of clients and i'm mm-hmm. just trying to think for the specific things for a lot of them sure. uh, for the actually for the ones that you brought up i would say a lot of it had to do with you know, when I think when you, you mentioned uh, Philip Morris, it was right. Philip Morris International, and that was that was a, a one off thing I did for them. But it was very typical because it was an international group. Right. Uh, mm, and I right. get a lot of teams like that where it's an international team where they had to be able to analyze audiences well to be able to get their points across. And forget forget about Philip Morris and the cigarettes and all that for a second, right. uh, <laughs> beca- it, because it's really I look at it as. Uh, everybody's got a challenge. Everybody's got a challenge about how they get their product, their idea 
across to somebody else. And you can look at it as salesmanship, but I just look at it as good communication. And the, the way to do that well is to understand what you want, what you want at the end of the day. If, and what I say to people sometimes is, you know, imagine you got what you wanted, you're doing a victory lap. What would make, what would have to happen for you to do that victory lap? But then, you know, once this is what you want, what are the obstacles based on who the people are? Right. In terms of from a cultural perspective, what are they thinking before you walk in the room? What um, what you know, what what hurdles do you have to jump over? What's on their mind? And the more analysis you do, the better it's going to be for you. And part of it for the international crowds is really thinking, all right, how are they different from me? But what do we share and how do I how can I demonstrate to them that I know what their culture is and I know what what is potentially broken and what I can do to solve their problems. Gotcha. So a lot of what I do has, you know, that's, that's a big umbrella of things, but it's really helping people understand what they want and what the barriers are and how to make that as smooth as possible. Not that you're always going to get to yes, but you certainly want to break them down. You want people nodding and say, oh, yes, I see. Oh, you've done your homework, so you understand me. So this is just not like an out-of-the-box presentation. Hey, Startup Nation. So today's content ran a bit over, and I don't want to get in trouble with my radio partners. So go to the startuplifepodcast.com and catch the bonus content from today's episode. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic, or would like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all-new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.